Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on native plants. This is the library's first Master Gardener webinar of 2023, so thank you for joining us. We have a very large group in attendance tonight, so this is clearly a hot topic. So let's get started. I'm going to pass it over now to our coordinator, Karen. Hi, Karen. Welcome, everyone. I know we're having a really um, big group tonight. It's really exciting. Um, just a few housekeeping issues as we begin. Um, all participants will be muted and they will have their videos turned off. This is to allow everyone to hear better and to see the speaker. This session will be recorded and posted on both the Master Gardener and the, the Contra Costa County YouTube channel for the public to access um, tonight's live session. Closed captioning in English will be available tonight and when accessing the recording version of this session posted on YouTube. So when you're using the Q&A feature to ask questions, um, be sure not to put your questions into the chat. Use the Q&A box. Now, since we have so many people expected tonight, we may not be able to get to all of your questions, but our speaker has prepared an amazing handout for you and has also copied her entire presentation. And that will be accessed at the end uh, by taking our survey, which the link is in the chat right now, and there'll be a QR code later on in the presentation. We understand that you might have to step away, but please remain logged into Zoom and do not sign out and back into the session. The waiting room feature is enabled and this could create a delay of you getting back in. We wouldn't want you to miss anything. Okay. So UC Master Gardeners of Contra Costa County is our mission to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices to the residents of Contra Costa, and that is you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, our topic is gardening with California natives, and our speaker is Anna Wendorf. Anna is a landscape architect designer and plant enthusiast. She's been designing gardens since earning her degree in landscape architecture from the University of California at Berkeley over 40 years ago. She currently is focused on working on designing sustainable gardens throughout the Bay Area. Anna became a master gardener in 2020 and has been working <laughs> on pollinator gardens, new master gardener training and plant ID classes. She spends her free time perusing plant and biology books and playing in her garden. Anna? Yes, okay, wonderful and welcome. It's such, uh, it's so great to see so many people interested in adding native plants to their garden or maybe just learning a little bit about it so that you can find out um, how to get inspired to do so. Um, you, uh, you may want to have more of a connection to our beautiful wild landscape. As you can see here, this is in uh, Black Diamond Mines. These are buckeyes. Um, as we go through the slides, I'll be telling you a little bit about some of the plants that are showing on each of the slides. And then uh, if you do fill out the survey, you'll get a copy of um, all of the slides. So you'll have the plant names there. So you don't have to worry about writing them all down really quickly. And here's some of the, th the topics that we're gonna be covering. Uh, why is it important to plant native plants? Uh, it's not just for fun, although that is a big part of it. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to select native plants for your specific garden. We're gonna talk about planting the natives so that they have a really good start. And we'll touch a little bit on maintaining natives in your garden to help your garden look like it's a, a suburban or an urban garden space rather than just a, a wild uh, thicket that you imported from some park somewhere. Uh, this here is a brown twig dogwood. This is growing in a pot. It is a great pollinator plant and uh, beautiful flowers, beautiful leaves, um, and one of the few that will do very, very well in a pot. And now we're gonna do a poll. 
find out what you're interested in. Okay, we're gonna launch that poll. Here we go. Now you can answer more than one question, answer everything that applies. I'll give it a few minutes here. We have so far about 550 viewers. So mm -hmm. uh, I want to get most of those. Oh, the answers are still coming in. I think this is one of our largest uh, webinars. I already have over 500 answers in there. I think we'll, I think we'll end the poll and look at the results now. Okay, sharing results. Lots of interest, uh, particularly in supporting pollinators. So, and uh -huh. reducing water use. Great to see everybody. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Okay. Um, do I just uh, click on a minimize on this or? Next slide. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about some of the benefits of, the, of um, putting in natives in your garden. Uh, we'll talk about um, supporting your local ecosystems, which uh, is a generous way of taking care of the earth where we're taking care of the pollinators, we're taking care of the birds and um, other aspects of the wild area around us. Um, we're going to talk about conserving resources such as water and uh, fuel. We'll reduce pollutants which get into the groundwater. They're easy to care for and they are beautiful. So here we have a sunset manzanita in the background. We have a Pacific mist manzanita, which is a lovely ground cover, very fast growing on the left side. And this is a pozo blue sage that has the beautiful flowers on it. But let's take a step back and look about look at why we have the kinds of gardens that we do have, which is very traditional lawn, some shrubs up against the house, and we maintain it by shearing it really tightly to keep it under control. This particular paradigm has been a status symbol for about 150 years. It's a neatness that we can understand. It's something that people understand. They go, this, this, this yard is part of our community. This is something that we feel is a, it's a unifying factor. This is a, a paradigm that we can wrap our minds around. They're static and unchanging, um, makes it a little bit simpler to understand. And the nurseries are offering plants that look cute in the little containers. They are plants that will look full when they're in a one gallon, um, one gallon container, something that has a lot of flowers on it. They're not necessarily adapted to our environment. They are adapted to nurseries and to growers. So we need to change how we shop for plants as well. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Here's a typical suburban yard. Um, some of the things that are important about um, our yards is that we want it to feel like people are taking care of it. We want it to feel intentional. Some of the signs of care of a garden over a wild space is some place that has crisp edges, well-defined paths and sitting areas, neatly maintain trees and shrubs and ground covers, something that's been pruned a little bit, maybe um, take out any dead wood, and also structural clues, which would be ways to contain the space so that you feel like it has a frame around it. That's going to make any kind of a wild space feel like it's intentional. That's something that we can add to our gardens 
it, no matter how wild they look, if you put a fence around it, if you put a little wall around it, it's going to look a little bit more intentional and you'll, it'll feel more like a garden instead of a wild space. One of the reasons that we do put in native plants is to support the ecosystem. This, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why the birds are declining and how we need to support them and the habitat for pollinators, which we've all heard a lot about in the recent years. Uh, this is a Mataliha poppy. It's best in a wilder area, part, a different part of the yard. Uh, maybe not right in the center, but it is a beautiful poppy um, flower that uh, uh, is beloved by many painters. Absolutely gorgeous plant. Now, many of you have talked about, uh, you, you answered on the survey that you're very interested in providing a habitat for pollinators. Bees and wasps are the most visible pollinators that we have, but there are many other much smaller pollinators that are native to our area. We have to support all of these pollinators, not just the, the honeybees that are actually imported from Europe. We want to support the butterflies, which are in decline right now. We have to give them nectar for the adults, but we also have to give them host plants for caterpillars. Butterflies and, and uh, moths are specifically um, evolved to only choose one kind of host plant for their babies. Um, as we all know, uh, the milkweed is the only plant that the monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on. And many of us have been planting milkweeds in order to support the monarch populations. Other butterflies and moths also have very specific plants. So we have to be sure to uh, support them as well. And they're only gonna be native plants. They're not going to be plants that have been brought in from uh, the Mediterranean or from Asia. And then of course the hummingbirds are also considered pollinators and we can provide them with some tubular flowers. This is a California fuchsia. This is a really beautiful form of California fuchsia that is a, a, it's a hybrid. You don't want to plant out the non-hybrid California fuchsias because they, they tend to spread, but this one is particularly beautiful and I'll show you a little bit more about it later. The habitat for birds. This is a real serious problem that we have in our, our um, uh, in our world right now. Uh, the songbirds are in a steep decline. They've declined 40% since 1970 in North America, 40%. I remember filming a birthday party in 1985 in my backyard and there were so many birds singing and I tried it again just a few years later and they were all gone. The same time of year, they're just not reproducing in our spaces. One of the reasons is that it takes so many caterpillars to raise their babies. They cannot feed their babies with anything but caterpillars, except for a couple of uh, like doves, they can, they can eat seeds. You may think that if you're putting out seeds or if they have berries or if they have aphids that they're going to be able to raise their babies on that. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the right kind of food for them. And that is one of the reasons for such a steep decline. Another reason that we can, another way that we can support our native birds is to provide berries for them that are healthy for them. Many of the imported berries have the wrong proportion of carbohydrates to fats, and it will not support them when they're migrating or when they're raising their babies. So we do need to support them with healthy berries. The toyon berries that you see there is one example. We also need to support our living soils. This is something that we don't think about very often because it's under the ground. We think of soils as a support for the plants just to hold them up. But there's really a complex 
ecosystem under the ground, it's a beautiful layered system that includes earthworms and fungi, fungi and nematodes and arthropods and all kinds of activity under the ground. When we are polluting the ground with extra fertilizers and too much water, these organisms cannot thrive. And so we are also sterilizing our soils when we over fertilize and uh, when we use all of these pesticides. Many of you uh, indicated that you were interested in planting natives because you were interested in reducing your water use. If you choose a plant that is suited to your particular garden space, you will use much less water. A lawn will use 150% uh, more water than a, a native plant garden. And uh, you'll also have less, guard, you'll, less yard waste because you won't have to keep replanting your garden. Once you choose the right plants for the garden, your, um, they can stay there for all, uh, for a hundred years and they'll be just fine. When we over fertilize and over mow and over blow our gardens, we are adding pollutants to the world. A, a leaf blower uses, will produce as much pollutant as one as 30 cars. It's a terrible way to add petrochemicals to our environment. It also blows all of the duff off of the soils so that our native insects can't burrow under the soil and they cannot emerge in the spring to uh, feed our birds and to reproduce. This is a Fiesta marigold uh, uh, monkey flower. It's a great uh, little flower to tuck in amongst other, all of the other flowers. It, this particular plant is um, short-lived, but it's um, easy, to, easy to make cuttings from it, and it blends well with some of the other plants. Native plants will take less maintenance than a traditional garden. You're not going to be shearing it. You're not going to be hedging it. And you're certainly not going to be mowing it as you would for a lawn. They require 30 to 60% less water than a traditional garden. They require no fertilizer if you choose the right plant for the right spot. And they don't need any pruning if you plant them at the right distance. They will have fewer pests because you're supporting an ecosystem that includes beneficial insects that will keep the other insects in check. And it will all balance itself out. Uh, this, this picture shows an Indian mallow, which is an abutilon palmarite. It does best in a little bit of shade and uh, just the most glorious, crisp yellow flowers. Super easy to grow. The purple flower is a margarita penstemon. Those are available just about everywhere. They spread wide and low. The uh, western redbud in the back hasn't been blooming in this picture, but it will bloom with a dark purple in the spring, and there is a yellow monkey flower. So many people think that a native garden is going to be twiggy and um, look wild. It doesn't have to be that way. And I'll show you some tips on how you can manage it so that it stays nicer and neater and will fit into a typical garden setting. These are, um, these are coast asters. They bloom in the summer. They're a great pollinator plant, as you can see here with the monarch on them. Uh, they also provide uh, nectar for tiny little insects that you can't see. And it's a great time of year to provide some, some flowers for uh, for the pollinators since uh, many of the other plants have stopped flowering in the in the late summer. 
I love sitting in my native garden because I can sit there and I can watch the birds come through and eat the berries. And I can watch the hummingbirds uh, sipping from the uh, California fuchsia. And I can watch the bees buzzing around. It's full of life. And I feel connected to the wild spaces around me that I love to go hiking in. I can, uh, I can feel like I've brought some of the glory of that area into my own space. And it's all a part of the continuum. The plants and uh, the animals that come through my garden can also enjoy a corridor that goes all the way up into the wild hills. And they can, uh, they can enjoy the flowers and the fruits in my garden and then nest up in the hills and then come back for a little bit of extra um, extra food. So I do feel very connected to all of the spaces around me. That's something that is underestimated, I think, in our, our local gardens. If you look around um, a typical suburban street, I walked down the street the other day and I saw eucalyptus and gorilla from Australia. I saw xylosma and privet from China some agapanthus from Afri uh, South Africa and some Italian cypress and lavender from the Mediterranean area. I saw maybe three native plants in the whole neighborhood. Our gardens have been so corrupted and so, um, so directed by the nursery industry that we have, uh, we have very few native plants in our gardens right now. There are over 5,000 native plants in California. We have a huge variety. 2,000 of those are available in the nursery trade, um, mostly from native plant nurseries, but they are there. We just need to figure out how to use them. I know that can be confusing and we'll talk a little bit more about why that, uh, how we can work our way through that and plant a garden that makes sense out of the native plants. And what is a native plant? Native plants can be defined in, in uh, these four different ways. Uh, a plant that is native to California could be from anywhere from the desert to the mountains, to the sea coast, to anywhere in California. I do like to use some of the plants, especially from Southern California that are going to be more adapted to uh, hotter conditions as the climate warms. Um, any, any plant from California, if it's adapted to your specific kind of uh, ecosystem is going to work just fine. So I wouldn't really worry about that. But purists are gonna say that you should only be using plants that are native to your local area. They're easy to find. A lot of the local nurseries will be carrying them. They're beautiful, they will do very well. You can also choose plants that are just native to your particular ecosystem. If you have a shady spot or if you have a hot, dry slope, you might want to choose some plants that are adapted to those particular conditions so that you'll have the best chance of success. You can look these plants up on Calscape and it will give you an advanced search. The advanced search will take, take you to a list of plants that are adapted to a type of ecosystem or to your specific area. And it's a great resource for hunting for na native plants. Another whole category is hybrids, which aren't really native to any particular part of California. They've been um, raised to give more garden characteristics. I use a lot of natives in my gardens. This here is a Dara's Choice Sage. It's a, it's a blend of two different sages. It has beautiful flowers. It's a low growing plant and it has really rich green leaves, which I'm always looking for in a native plant to give you some good contrast. Okay, now we're gonna take some questions. Karen? Okay, so do we have some questions? Yes. Uh, quite a few questions coming in. I just want to let to everybody know, and some of our viewers may have noticed, we have four master gardeners answering questions behind the scenes. 
We have Lori and Marilyn on live stream and Gail and Liz on, on our uh, Zoom uh, answering questions, but we've saved some to answer live uh, for you with Anna. And the first one is, are hybrids less beneficial to native bees and insects compared to natives from other local areas? That's a great question. It really depends. So if you're using it as a host plant for a butterfly or a moth, you will probably need to use a specific plant adapted to that particular to, to that moth or butterfly. But if you're using it as a nectar plant, they are much more adaptable and you can get away with just about any plant that they will be attracted to with a caveat. Some of the hybrid plants uh, have double flowers or different shaped flowers and the, the pollinators that are adapted to that particular plant won't be able to access the nectar because the flower shape is different. But in general, I wouldn't really worry about it. If you're providing a hybrid plants, if you're providing any plants at all, it's going to be beneficial and the, the pollinators will find them, the ones that are going to be able to use them. Okay, next question. Um, this listener is curious how to integrate natives into her existing garden because natives don't need much water once established and maybe some of the other plants in her garden are a little thirstier. That's excellent. I, I will be talking a little bit about, more about that and a little bit, uh, a, a little bit later. You'll want to choose plants that are more closely adapted to the ecosystem in which you're putting them. So if you're putting it near a lawn, you'll want to choose something that is, uh, native to a riparian area, someplace that can take a little bit of flooding. If you're planting it out in other shrubbery, you can you can adapt the irrigation system to give them a little bit less water. You want to plant natives higher than you would plant other plants so that you give them some better drainage than other plants that that'll uh, that'll help quite a lot too. And there there are some native plants that are, just in general, more adaptable. They'll take a little bit more water, they'll take a little bit less water. And we do have a list of those plants on the handout. Great. So a couple of questions here about soil and native plants. Um, there's two, so I'm gonna kind of piggyback them together. Um, one is, should we use mulch between native plants? If so, what type of mulch is best? Mm -hmm. um, We've heard some mulches create a fungus harmful to natives. Um, some mulches are considered not fire safe with our fire escaping landscapes. Mm. Mm. And um, do you even need to amend clay soil with native plants? So those are all the soil questions. Okay, so we have soil and we have mulch. Uh, with the soils, it's mm. recommended that you do not amend the soils. I do like to plant them a little bit high uh, to, to make sure that they have the good drainage. You want to choose plants that are adapted to the soil that you have. So you can look it up on the Calscape site to find plants that are adapted to clays or to sands or whatever soil you have. Most of them are clays around in this area. So you'll want to find plants that are adapted to clay, then you'll be fine. As far as the mulch goes, if you have a plant that's growing naturally in the chaparral, you would want to use a rock mulch around the plant base itself. You don't have to cover the whole ground with, with the rock mulch, but around where the plant root ball is and maybe out to the drip line, you might want to use some rock. Some people will even put a fairly large rock on the south side of a root ball to shade the roots and then just leave the rest of it bare. You can do that also. Uh, the uh, the traditional mulch, you don't want it to touch the crown of the plant. You want to pull it back away from the plant, but it does help hold in the moisture. So it, in general, it's a good idea to put the mulch on the surface of the soil um, to a depth of about two inches, just to make sure that you can maintain the coolness and the uh, even moisture. 
and the fire escaping is a whole other issue. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to take one more question. We're going to go back to the presentation and then we can, um, we'll have a lot of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, last question. What about natives that can live near my dreaded black walnut tree? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, if it's directly under the walnut tree, uh, it is going to be a short list. We don't have that on the handout, but that's something that you can call the help desk to find out. And I will help them through that if they need it. Uh, if they need help answering that question, we'll do some research. Okay, um, let's continue and we'll um, we'll take more questions at the okay. end. And our master gardeners are behind the scenes, busily answering questions as well. Excellent. I'd love to see what people are asking. Okay, now. This is the part that's really fun for me, the native plant selection. Right here, you can see a California aster and Margarita penstemon, and it's next to a non-native asteriscus, which I do tuck in sometimes. It actually is a good pollinator plant, even though it's not native to California, it's native to the Mediterranean region. Number one, in choosing a plant, especially a California native plant, is you have to do your site analysis. You need to know what kind of soil you have, how much water the plant is going to be getting, if it's next to a lawn, or if you have an irrigation system. What kind of drainage do you have? Is it on a slope? Is it in a low spot? And the sun and the shade, which you have to actually track through the year to get a really accurate assessment. But that's, that's going to be a major part of what, how you're going to be choosing the plants. And then critters, deer, and gophers. That You just need to know if you're going to have a lot of deer in your yard because that will limit the number of plants that you have. We'll be covering each of these separately in just a minute. Uh, this is a blue-eyed grass. Uh, it's a beautiful little perennial. You can grow it in a meadow. You can grow it on the edge of a garden. It mixes beautifully with some sea, uh, seaside daisies, um, any, any perennial that you want to have it grow through. It's absolutely beautiful. You can do it in a mass and this does reproduce in your garden. So you'll have a lot of them if you just plant one. There's a short version and then there's a tall version. There's also a yellow version, which is a slightly different uh, variety. The four foundations of success. This is true of any plant that you put in your garden. You want to make sure that you have the soil that the plant is going to need. In the case of natives, you need to know what your soil is and match the plant to the soil rather than trying to make the soil match to the plant. And the water, again, you want to assess what kind of water you have, how much you're willing to give and uh, address the, the watering. We'll talk a little bit more about the watering later but you want to um, you want to map the watering to the type of plant that you have. Aeration is hugely important for native plants. They're used to having quite a lot of air in the soil. This is your drainage. This is your loose soil. This is your sandy soils and rocky soils. You want to make sure that you have a a, a lot of air in the soil and the sun. This is how much the plant is adapted to having sun or shade. It's going to be different uh, in different parts of our county. So in the, in, uh, next to the bay, you can get away with having a lot of these plants out in full sun and they'll be just fine. You bring those same plants inland on the other side of the hills and you're gonna need to give them a little bit of light shade, especially in the afternoon. So here's a fictitious yard. We're going to try populating this with plants with a few, um, few suggested plants uh, on, on the plant list. This is just going to be a taste of some of the plants that you can use to find a more con uh, complete list. You wanna go with, to Calscape or talk to one of the uh, nursery people uh, at a native plant nursery, or you can look at the lists that we are providing at the end. 
So this is our fictitious yard has clay soil and part shade in the backyard. In the front yard, it's a hot full sun slope. So let's see what we can come up with here. To analyze your site, these are the design needs. You've already assessed what kind of soil you have, how much light and so forth, but now you do have design needs as well. You need to know if you're gonna want a shade tree, if you have to block off the view of your neighbor's RV, or if you want to just have a little bit more privacy. You want to put in shrubs for backbone and structure, and you, you want to fill in in between all of these shrubs that are planted at the appropriate spacing with some infill. We'll talk about those in a minute. This is a very underutilized plant. It's a pigeon point coyote bush. If you cut these back really hard every winter, and I'm talking almost to the ground if you need to, they come out as beautiful and lush as a boxwood. They're absolutely gorgeous. If you don't take care of it this way, it can get kind of twiggy, which has given it a really bad name. In the background there, you can see uh, two different kinds of ceanothus. In the far back, that's a Yankee point, and then there's a variegated one, which is also available. There's several variegated ceanothus. After you've assessed what kinds of plants you need, if you need a tree, you need some shrubs, you know what your soil type is, you know where the sun and the shade goes throughout the day, you can start to think about the fun stuff, which is the, uh, the style. What kind of colors do you want to have in your garden? Do you want to have a natural garden? Do you want to have a cottage garden? Do you want something that's a little bit stricter that will show off your contemporary house with your horizontal fence boards and uh, clean lines. We'll talk about those. Um, this is a De La Mina Verbena, which is super easy to grow. It makes a big mound of purple. It's kind of fluffy. And here is a, a Marin Pink California Fuchsia, which um, is great for a pastel garden. It stays nice and compact. It's a little bit, it's about a, a two feet tall and uh, beautiful coral pink flowers. Here is a contemporary garden. This is actually along a street, but I have seen many uh, contemporary gardens that have used this deer grass to great effect. It just looks stunning. In a row like this, it's just fine. The animals, the pollinators, they don't care whether you plant in a straight line or whether you plant in, in squares or if you plant it in a natural uh, arrangement. As long as they have access to a variety of plants within your space, they're going to be content. Now you can arrange your plants to suit your own style. For a contemporary garden, you want to have plants that repeat. You want to have plant groupings that repeat. You want to keep it fairly simple. And you want to use plants that have a real bold form like these deer grass do. The layering is coming in with some ground cover under these deer grass, fills in the space and makes the, the garden look real lush while still maintaining that crisp, uh, excited look on the deer grass. Another garden style, very popular, is a cottage garden. It's super easy to do if you just get every kind of flowering native plant that there is and put them at the right spacing. This is what it's gonna look like after just a few years. This garden is most likely in part shade, could be in a little bit of sun if it was in Berkeley. Uh, this, these, this, this particular garden has the coral bells in the background. It has a couple of different kinds of uh, monkey flowers. And it also has some, um, in the back, you can see some coffee berries and some ribes. Just a beautiful mix of flowers. As you walk through here, you can enjoy all of these, um, all of these flowers, all these blooms, and the pollinators will go crazy in it. To keep it looking like a garden instead of a mess, you want to give it some nice crisp edges with some sitting areas and some well-defined paths. Uh, this is a natural garden. Uh, this is 
focused more on textures where you're going to be contrasting some heavy silvery colored uh, uh, silvery manzanitas against some small leafed dark greens and some bold uh, white sage. This is where you're going to have you're going to play the textures off of each other and you're going to have an arrangement of taller and short plants. The way to make these work is you make islands of a tall plant with medium shrubs and some low ones around it and you keep repeating that pattern through the garden. It gives it a sense of unity while at the same time keeping it feeling really natural. Using rocks and mounds and other earth shaping keeps it uh, very natural looking. It's it's a just a really lovely kind of a garden to have. This is a Dr. Hurd manzanita, nice round, bold, silvery leaves, and an emerald carpet manzanita. The emerald carpet manzanita is easy to get, but it also is a little bit tricky unless you grow it in a little bit of shade in the east part of the county. Uh, you can grow it in the in the sun in uh, on the west side of the hills. Some of the tricks to make it look more like a garden and less like a wild space. You want to have some contrast. You wanna pull some silvers up against the greens. You wanna have bold leaves against some of the smaller ones and some of the fluffy plants. You want to add some grasses for contrast and for some, some excitement. You want to repeat the same groupings throughout the garden. That's going to make it feel unified rather than just a, a collection of plants. And most importantly, you want to give every plant the right amount of space to grow so that they're not growing into each other. You won't need to be trimming them back. They can have their, they can produce their, their full shape. They can grow to their full natural size. Now we're going to talk about some specific plants to fill in our, our uh, fictitious garden. This is a California fuchsia, Matol Select. It's a nice compact variety, beautiful, brilliant orange red flowers and a silver leaf and Fricart's Aster. Beautiful in a big mass. Again, this blooms in the summer. We've already covered the site conditions, the design needs, and the style, and now we're going to talk about some specific plants. Here are some wild plants, and we don't necessarily want to bring in every wild plant into our garden. There will be select plants that are available at nurseries that will do well in a garden setting. So we'll talk about trees first, in case we need a little bit of shade. Many of us already have live oaks in our garden that are providing shade and we have to garden under them. There are specific native plants that will do well under oaks and won't overwater the oaks so we can protect the health of the trees. On the right side, you see a, a live oak that was planted in a wild space and it has been kept into a, in a small shape. I would rather see more native wild oaks, uh, more native um, coast live oaks in gardens if they were pruned, if we needed to have a small tree rather than uh, choosing a, an exotic tree, I would rather I would rather that you planted a, sm a live oak and kept it small, which I know is sacrilege, but consider using them even if you do have a smaller space. Here's a California buckeye. They're fairly slow growing. The flowers smell like Hawaii. They're absolutely gorgeous. The drawback on the California buckeye is that it does lose its leaves all, uh, all pretty much all summer. Beautiful silvery trunks, but not many people want to have a tree that's deciduous all summer. The black oak is something that hasn't been planted nearly enough. It's absolutely gorgeous. The leaves are lush. As you can see there, they're very green. They have, um, it has pretty fall color, not super spectacular, but very nice. And it is a keystone species, very helpful to the pollinators and to the birds. 
small garden trees. This is something that not that pe I'm always getting people asking uh, for small garden trees because most of our properties aren't that huge and we want something that's manageable size. The Western redbud is always a great go-to. It doesn't need any additional water. It has a beautiful pinkish uh, flower in the spring and a nice round, neat leaf in the summer. The only drawback to the Western redbud is that it does have those seed pods which need to be removed uh, to keep it really neat in the late summer into fall. And the toyon, you'll see toyon coming up in several of these categories because it is a very adaptable plant. It'll grow in sun, it'll grow in shade, it'll make a small tree, you can prune it into a hedge. It provides berries for the birds, uh, just a great all around plant. I will tell you the drawback on the on the toyons is that every few years they do get an overrun of some thrips on them, but it's worth putting up with that because they are such an adaptable plant. Some more small garden trees. The vine maple, some people put these in um, thinking that it's going to be a good substitute for a Japanese maple. It's not really going to have the same shape, but it is beautiful in a woodland garden and you can get some beautiful fall color on it. Sometimes it's red, sometimes it's yellow. It's a fairly slow growing tree, gives you that real lush woodland look. The Catalina cherry, there are a couple of different varieties that you can get. Uh, nice hedging plant and also a great small tree if it's pruned up properly. Also a great keystone plant. It provides a lot of food for birds and pollinators. So some large shrubs. You can use these for uh, as screening. Uh, these can also be hedged. Both of these can be hedged. You can cut them back. You can't do that with every kind of a native, every native plant. But with these, you can prune them fairly heavily and they will come back just fine. The sugar bush um, grows quickly and you can make a, a drink out of the berries. It looks very polished in a front garden. You can prune it into a hedge as small as three feet tall if you need to. And it's a great pollinator plant also. The Pacific wax myrtle is a uh, just the luscious, be most beautiful green, but it does need to be pruned a little bit in order to keep it in this um, dense greenery. Otherwise it tends to get a little bit leggy, but it's worth it. It's absolutely the most beautiful color of green and very easy to grow. And here's the toyon again, uh, grown as a large shrub. And this, you can see it in, uh, it's getting ready to bloom. Um, and Ceanothus, I mean, Ceanothus is just one of our standard, most beautiful garden shrubs. People have, in Europe have been planting Ceanothus for years, way before we discovered how wonderful they were here in California, where they came from. There's so many hybrids. Some of them are really big. Uh, the, the Ray Hartman, you can train into a tree if you're very patient. The concha is super tough. It has tiny little leaves and beautiful dark blue flowers in the early spring. There are so many beautiful ceanothus, you really can't go wrong. You do need to give them very good drainage and be very careful about summer watering on ceanothus. People will say that ceanothus is short-lived and the reason is that they are overwatering them. So don't don't give them a don't give them too much water and they should give you many many years of growth they're all super fast growing so if you need some infill really quickly you can always put in a ceanothus so providing a backbone for the garden something that gives you some structure something that will show off some of the other plants make it feel like it's really part of a garden. You want to repeat these through the garden to give, you, to give it a sense of weight and also to give it some evergreen uh, structure in the, in the winter time. I love using the California coffee berry in part shade in the inland and in full sun uh, in, the, in the Western part of the county. 
There are several varieties. This one is probably a leather leaf. It could be a Mount San Bruno. There's also one that has a larger leaf that is absolutely beautiful in contrast with some of the smaller, finer leafed fluffy plants. And that one is Eve Case. The Valley Violet Cianothus is my favorite. This one is my front yard. Absolutely can't be beat. It's more beautiful than a lilac in my eyes. Super small. It only grows to about two and a half feet tall, about four feet wide, easy to keep in shape. Beautiful plant, a little bit hard to locate in the nurseries, but hopefully it will be more available in the future. There are other maritimus that are also really beautiful. Uh, there's one called popcorn that has a white flower and there's a frosty dawn that is lower growing and a little bit paler blue. They do need a little bit of light shade in the afternoon and uh, except in, in the West County, they can take full sun. Very compact, really beautiful. Here's some manzanitas that you can use to give you give a structure. You could plant a whole garden out of manzanitas and it would not be boring. All you have to do is bring in some with larger leaves, some with smaller leaves, some tight, tight looking uh, manzanitas like this sunset and uh, some that flower at different times of, of the spring. They're all going to be flowering in the winter and spring. Great pollinator plants. They feed the hummingbirds in the winter when some of the other, when none of the other plants are blooming. Beautiful plants. You really just can't go wrong with manzanitas. There are some tricks to manzanitas. You do need to give them very good drainage. And the pruning we'll talk about in the pruning section is very specific to manzanitas because they are susceptible to fungal problems. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, sculptural shrubs. So here's another manzanita that's been pruned up. You with some manzanitas, you can keep them tight and compact. Actually, only two varieties that I would recommend doing that with. But all of the others, as they grow, you'll be pruning them up and you'll get these beautiful red twisted stems. Nice way to, to give some, add some drama and some height in your garden. Here are a couple of shrubs for light shade. The flowering currant is one of the best pollinator shrubs that you can get. It's great for feeding the hummingbirds. It uh, provides all kinds of cover and food for, uh, for the, uh, the native insects. So the birds are going to be able to feed their babies. There are berries in the, in the fall to feed the birds. It's just an all around great wildlife plant. Plus it's beautiful, super easy to grow and very fast too. And the huckleberry is gorgeous. It has little tiny leaves that are very shiny. And then these gorgeous white flowers that hang down in little bells. Again, the hummingbirds love it. It's a beautiful garden plant. It grows fairly quickly and it does produce berries, which are delicious, but usually if you're growing it in your own garden, you're not going to get to the berries before the birds do. This one is growing in a pot. It's one of the plants that can do well in a pot. All right, now we're talking about the, the manzanita. This is a Howard McMinn that has been pruned and uh, it's easy to keep it in a neat shape. The Howard McMinn manzanita was introduced, oh gosh, um, I was studying this back in college in 1980. One of the few manzanitas that was available in the trade at that time, there were maybe three native plants that we commonly used and this was one of them. I have seen these sheared with the electric head shears. I've seen them pruned up into beautiful little trees. You can do just about anything with it as long as you're really careful about the timing of your pruning. The Warner Lytle buckwheat is a great pollinator plant. It does produce some nice little flowers and you can prune this into any shape that you want. Uh, nice one for the front yard to keep that real neat shape. If you have a wilder area, let's say up on a hill or a little bit further away from your house or someplace where you're not really worried about what the neighbors think, you can use, you can grow uh, white sage 
there are uh, there's a new variety out that is a compact variety. It is it smells heavenly, and you can dry the leaves and make um, saging sticks. The Winifred Gilman sage also has a really wonderful uh, strong scent. It is a great pollinator plant. It provides cover for a number of birds. Really healthy plant to grow in your garden. Again, it has a very strong scent, very strong sagey scent. So uh, you want to take that into consideration if you're gonna be planting that. And a California sage, which is not really a sage, Artemisia, wonderful pineapple scent. These are short-lived plants. They do very well on hot, dry slopes and uh, just heavenly to have in the garden. There is a variety that grows low and will hang over a wall, very soft and fluffy. Here are a couple of shrubs that will spread really quickly over the ground to give you a lot of cover right away. If you want to just have an instant yard, you could plant a couple of these, maybe one of each, and your whole yard will be covered within a year. The Yankee Point Cenothus is one of those that was offered in the trade in 1980. And really, you can hardly kill this plant. It's so easy to grow. You can give it a little bit of water. You can give it a lot of water. You can prune it to the ground. It'll come back out. Super easy plant. It blooms beautifully in the spring and a little bit throughout the rest of the year. Nice big fat leaves. Grows very fast. I would plant them eight to 10 feet apart. The Bees Bliss Sage, also very fast. It'll grow about two feet tall and spreads at least eight feet. This needs to be cut back really hard every few years to keep it really fresh looking. It does have the flowers, uh, the pollinators, the, the insects, the birds, everybody loves this sage. Ah, some grasses. So this is the deer grass that I was talking about earlier. It always looks great. This is one of those grasses that you don't have to cut back if you don't want to. It just keeps producing new green leaves at the base. And it looks uh, amazing when, you, when it's backlit from the sun like this. You can take a rake and clean out some of the dead leaves if you want to. And you can cut it back to the ground if you feel that you want it to come back all, out all fresh and green. Make a little mound about a foot tall. This is a Mendocino reed grass here in a front yard in Clayton. Uh, it's very soft, very beautiful. Uh, people just really love, and this has been on the garden tour and, and it was one of the highlights of this particular yard. People just love it. It is a fairly short-lived grass. You'll need to replant it every three years or divide it, um, but it's worth putting in to the garden to uh, give it a little bit of flair while the other things are growing in. Some ground covers. This is Yerba Buena. It is native to our area right here. And um, it is a super easy, low growing plant, very, very short. Um, couple of inches tall. It tends to send out one runner and then another runner. So it's not gonna be a super dense ground cover, but in a place where there's a little bit of shade, it can provide a little bit of cover under the other plants. And yes, you can make tea out of it. Ceanothus, uh, there are several varieties that are low growing. Most of them need a little bit of shade inland because they are native to areas along the coast. Anchor Bay has been one that I've worked, used in the sun and have had good luck with, even in the inland areas. Uh, there are many others that are low growing. Uh, just visit your local nursery and you can find them. Super fast growing. Some more ground covers. Uh, so this is, the, this is the, the Pigeon Point Coyote bush that I was talking about. Great if you can cut it back. If you don't cut it back, it does get a little bit of wood, a little bit woody, but it's so lush and so green. One of those beautiful greens that's hard to get in other plants. And this is an emerald carpet manzanita. There are other low-growing manzanitas that are really beautiful. All kinds of Ova Ursi varieties, gradient and uh, Monterey carpet, absolutely gorgeous. 
most of these will need a little bit of shade on the, in the inland, and they do require uh, careful watering in the in the uh, summer. You want to just sprinkle their leaves. You don't want to you don't want to overwater them, or they will die out. I speak from experience. And some flowers in a native garden. You're going to get most of your flowers in the perennials. In a traditional garden, you can plant shrubs that will give you a lot of color, mostly native to China and some in the Mediterranean area, like the roses and the camellias. But for a native garden, you can count on low growing perennials to give you the color that you need. This is your California fuchsia, the Matol Select, one of my favorites the Scarlet Bugler, which uh, it's just a uh, really intense uh, red and the hummingbirds just go crazy for it. It grows about two feet tall. I found it to be about two feet tall, full sun, about three feet wide. Penstemon Margarita Bop, which we've talked about, which spreads low. And we have a monkey flower in the back. This is an, a yellow one. There's also a gorgeous red one called uh, Brilliant Red. And then there was also the um, Fiesta Marigold that we saw before. There are a number of named varieties that have, um, that have a lot of different colors. They're absolutely gorgeous. The, the straight yellow is going to live longer than most of the other hybrids that have the larger flowers, but they're all worth growing. And this is a San Bruno Mountain Golden Aster. Nice matte forming plant, which gives it that neatness. That, uh, unifies a garden really well. Now these are all buckwheats. And the reason I'm showing just a whole page of buckwheats is that, again, you could do a whole garden of buckwheats. If you just did buckwheats and manzanitas, it would look beautiful. You really couldn't go wrong. I have seen some beautiful gardens done with a variety of sulfur buckwheats. They come, uh, they, they come in slightly different colors of oranges and yellows and a couple of red flowering buckwheats, and you could tuck in some seaside daisies and you have a whole garden. That's all you need. You don't, you can't really go wrong. Most of the buckwheats are going to be low growing, mat forming. There are some taller varieties. They're on the list on the handout. Uh, any of these are gonna be fast growing, super easy, drought tolerant, and they're just amazing for the birds and all of the pollinators go crazy for them. Some more flowers. Uh, here's a hummingbird sage. It forms a low mat of large leaves, which smell wonderful, and you can use them in tea. The hummingbirds go crazy for these pink flowers that pop up about 18 inches above the, the low foliage. It does best in part shade, and it will form a mat that's kind of an uneven mat, so it's nice to grow some other things around uh, mixed into it to, to cover the ground. You can see the De La Mina Verbena. This plant has become so popular lately that it's sold even in big box stores. It makes a huge mound that is about oh, three feet tall generally and maybe five to six feet wide, just covered with these purple flowers. The hummingbirds love it, the butterflies love it, pollinators buzzing all over it. Excellent plant, super easy. When it gets a little bit too big, you can cut it back to a little mound and it should come back out again. This is a Douglas iris, beautiful, beautiful solid iris flowers in the spring, very easy to grow. One time I was up at a, a lake up in Marin, the whole hillside was covered with Douglas irises in all different colors, purples and yellows and whites. Uh, just a really spectacular, super easy plant. And obviously those weren't getting any extra water. They were just growing there on a wild hillside. So you can grow those in your yard, super easy. Some more flowers. Uh, seaside daisy is one of my favorites because it's very compact and it blends well with some of the other flowers. If you mix this in with some of the blue, uh, the blue eyed grass, you could mix it in with the, any of the buckwheats. The penstemons, absolutely beautiful plant, nice and compact. When the flowers are done, you can cut it back to 
to the, the, the about an inch tall and it comes back out really beautifully. This is on, on the right side, you see a checker bloom. It's a little bit floppy, but just a really fun surprise to tuck in amongst the grasses. Now this is infill. And the reason I'm talking so much about infill is because I'm recommending that you plant the plants at the proper spacing. Make sure that you give them plenty of room you can find this information on the Calscape web website. You can find it in many places, how wide these plants are going to be growing. Plant them that far apart and you're going to have a lot of bare ground in between. So while you're waiting, you can put in annuals, you can put in some short-lived perennials, you can put in your buckwheats, you can put in a number of low-growing plants. These are all going to be, well, they're, they're annuals and perennials that act like annuals. Miner's lettuce, just one, if you plant out one plant next year, you're gonna have a whole yard full of it in part shade. It's delicious, makes a great salad. The Chinese houses in part shade again, absolutely beautiful. The um, baby blue eyes and California poppies, great mixture. You can get wildflower seeds at many local nurseries. You want to make sure that they are actually native plant seeds, not just a wildflower mix, which is not necessarily going to be native to California. A lot of native, uh, a lot of uh, wildflower mixes have cosmos and other wild, other other exotic plants in them. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you get an authentic California wildflower mix. Okay. This is a beautiful garden in Walnut Creek. Um, it has uh, Salvia Dara's Choice. That's the green in the back. Uh, silver Carpet, which is a great infill plant, great pollinator plant, grows so fast you can sit and watch it grow. And the Sunset Manzanita, which is just starting to fill in, it's going to get real dense. That's in the foreground. Okay. So when you're first planting them out, this is a question that many people ask, how do you plant for greatest, the greatest success? You want to dig a hole that is just slightly larger than the root ball. Some sites will say that you dig it twice as wide. It's not really gonna hurt it if you do that, but you don't really want to dig it too big and you don't wanna dig it too deep because as the plant sinks, it, you, it will, um, it will reduce its, uh, the aeration in the soil. You want to plant it a little bit high. You want to plant, um, uh, and, and you, don't, you don't dig the soil down lower than the root ball in the container that you're using. Before you plant it out, you want to saturate the ground where you're gonna be planting it. Just put on as much water as you possibly can. Some of the websites, even they say, just leave, leave the water on overnight. I wouldn't go that far. But, Fill the hole, definitely let, fill the hole several times, let it soak into the surrounding ground. While you're filling the hole, you can check and make sure that you have some good drainage in that hole. If the water doesn't sink down within a few minutes, then you know that you have to fix the drainage. You have to uh, either raise the ground up and plant on a little bit higher mound, or you have to uh, drain the hole in some other way by providing a channel for it to escape, from, uh, for the water to escape from that hole. And uh, plant high, you do want to plant high. All of these native plants, you want to plant high. That doesn't mean that you leave the root ball exposed on the edges. You build a mound up to the root ball, you plant it a little bit high. So it's gonna look like it's on a little bit of a mound. That's also going to help when you're putting the mulch in because the mulch won't come all the way up to the, um, to the top of the root ball. No uh, soil amendment and no fertilizer. That's something that we've been trained to do over the years with uh, all of these imported exotic plants. They need all the help they can get. They need lots of water. They need extra fertilizer. They need lots of amendments. We have to change the soil to suit the plants, but we don't do that with the native plants. Okay, and watering, uh, the, 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 uh, the, when you're planting it, you flood the soil, 
And uh, the first year you want to you want to fuss over them and you want to check on them every week at least to make sure they're not drying out all the way. And you want to check on uh, check to make sure that you're watering appropriately for what the species is. You can find that on Calscape. I need to speed up a little bit here. Um, pruning is really a whole other topic. I just want you to be careful. Research with what plant you have so that you can make sure that you're pruning it appropriately. That information should be on Calscape and it's available online. Okay, where can you learn more about native plants? So there are garden tours. We have them listed on the handouts, demonstration gardens, and uh, we also listed our online resources. So why do we plant native plants? Because it is the right thing to do because it will support the pollinators and the birds and because it will um, help us feel connected to California. And we've been through selecting them, planting them and maintaining them. Okay, here's another poll. I'm sorry, I ran over a little bit here. Okay, let's launch the poll. Here we go. And you may answer more than, there's more than one answer. Any, any and all. So far the leader is tucking a few native plants into an existing garden. Right followed by replacing whole sections with vignettes. <laughs> I think that's, that's a majority of the results. So let's share that. Okay, so out of 350 answers, most people are interested in tucking mm -hmm. a few native plants into their existing okay. garden. There, there is information on that on the handout. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Anna, thank you very much for your presentation. I know we're running a little over. Yeah. Um, our behind the scenes master gardeners have already answered close to 100 questions. And I've saved a few for you to answer. We still have time to cover questions as well. Okay. But if we are not able to get to every one of your questions, you can come visit us on our website, uh, ccmg.ucanr.edu. And you can follow us on social media, Coco MGUC. And tonight and all prior programs will also be posted on our YouTube channel by going to Coco MGUC and looking under live. If you have specific questions, our help desk experts can help you at ccmg at ucanr.edu, and they will research and answer many of your questions for you. Okay, next slide. We have several programs coming up the rest of the year. This is our first program of 2023 but you can look for Firewise Landscaping and other seasonal programs all the way through November. Help us serve you better by following up and answering our survey. Um, the link was in the chat and we also have a QR code coming up on the next slide here. There it is. You can also use this QR code or the link in the chat. Now, once you complete the survey, you will receive a thank you page. And on that thank you page, you're gonna find not one, but two handouts. Anna has been very generous with her time. She has a whole plant list for you, um, different native plants for various circumstances, as well as she has copied her entire presentation as a PDF 
on the second handout for you tonight. In case you saw a particular plant, you couldn't remember what the name was, you can certainly go back to that uh, handout and get that information. Okay, let's start taking some of the questions and we're, our master gardeners are still answering the behind the scenes. So let's get the first one. Um, several viewers were curious about incorporating native plants that were medicinal or edible. And I noticed you mentioned uh -huh. your buena could be made into a tea. Are there other native plants? Well, there are several that you can use as a tea and as seasoning, of course. Um, you could do the native bay. Um, you can use any of the sages, although they probably wouldn't have the same flavor as uh, uh, the Salvia officinalis, which is the regular sage. Uh, as far as edibles, you, there, there's, there's it, it, managing an edible garden in the wild is really different from using uh, net, uh, a growing like a vegetable garden or a, a fruit tree orchard, it's not really, it's not really going to work out as well. Uh, we should do a whole other talk about how to uh, how to use native plants in as edibles. But uh, it's hard to grow just a uh, a plant that you can use as an edible. It's it's a whole other uh, complex system. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So probably six or more questions about four-legged pests in the garden. And I'd say the, the least popular one seems to be the deer. Um, they're yeah. doing a lot of browsing and they're starting to eat things that are on the, the no eat plant list. They do. Yeah. Any, especially when it gets dry. Yeah. Any yeah. recommendations? Well, for one thing, look at this beautiful lupin, which is growing out in the wild. Uh, they generally will not eat really strongly flavored plants like the sages. Uh, they will nibble on the manzanitas and the ceanothus in most areas. Uh, the grasses are generally spared. So you could grow deer grass, which they don't eat, which is ironic and uh, any of the other native grasses they're not going to be browsing on that if you mix in some wildflowers you should have a pretty sturdy garden okay um i know during your presentation you probably answered this but it's this question's come up a couple times. Are there any native plants that look the same all year long, that they don't yes. die back in winter, they stay green and lovely? That's a great question. Yeah, many of the plants that I was showing, many of the shrubs that I was showing will look the same all year round. The Pacific wax myrtle, the manzanitas will look the same all year. The, uh, the ceanothus, except when they're blooming, will look the same all year round. Uh, the, uh, the coffee berries all look the same. Those are great structural plants. So any of those will do very well. The buckwheats are gonna change through the season. Um, and of course, all of those mat forming perennials are gonna change through the year. Okay. Um... Several of our, our viewers want to know what your favorite California native plant is, and if you would come consult in their garden. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Well, I um, my my favorite native plant is probably my Valley Violet Ceanothus because it's so gorgeous in the spring and it stays very compact. I do find myself using the sunset manzanita quite a lot because it's very adaptable. It'll take a little bit of water, it'll take less water and it's really compact. So it looks great in a traditional garden and it you can this is a great plant, plant to um, add to a traditional garden because it'll take the same kinds of conditions. Um, 
And then of course, oak trees, anywhere you can stuff an oak tree because it is a keystone uh, species, it's going to help the birds so much. Um, I do like using those. So I, not one plant, but the, those are the ones that I use over and over again. Okay. Um, what natives do well in containers? Oh, that's fun. Okay, so uh, the uh, the brown twig dogwood that I showed in one of the first slides, that does very well. Uh, I have grown a deer grass in a container and it has done really well. And I put it where the, the light shines through in the evening. So it, it lights up, it's gorgeous. And any of the perennials are gonna do well, especially the ones that don't spread too much. So the seaside daisy mixed with a penstemon and then having some of the, uh, the yerba buena spilling over the edge, it's a great combination. You could put in some grasses if you want to. Having a combination of, of plants like that is gonna do really well. Anything that's a perennial is gonna do great. The shrubs can be tricky. There are a few manzanitas that do well, but uh, some of them will not. So you have to be, uh, you have to do some research on that. Okay, um, Allison would like to know if she could propagate a red bud from seeds. Should be no problem. Um, there are some great books on propagating California plants and, and uh, some of the plants you have to do some massive work to get the seeds to sprout. I am not familiar with that one. I don't think that one's very hard. Some of them you have to set on fire and some of them you have to scrape with sandpaper and put in the refrigerator for six weeks. Um, so it's worth researching it. Okay. Um, this viewer has a slope in their backyard that goes down into a riparian area. Mm -hmm. uh, very little sun, it's a shady place. Oh, um, nice they were looking for specific plants, um, an amph amorpha californica or a Pacific peas, it says. Um, what would you recommend for this shady riparian site? If you can take a little bit of height, I really like the flowering currant and the flowering gooseberries. They make a nice thicket. Uh, and uh, they're, they're such great uh, uh, pollinator and bird supports. If you need something a little bit shorter, there, uh, there is a uh, Ribes uh, vibranifolium, uh, Catalina, uh, oh, the, the common name escapes me, but, uh, that Ribes viburnifolium, it'll take the shade. It's just, uh, it'll grow low if you prune it a little bit. Um, I like a spice bush. They form a thicket and beautiful big leaves with brilliant yellow fall color. Those are great uh, thicket plants also. Okay. Lots of questions about milkweed. We were talking about oh, mommy yes. butterflies uh -huh. and that they only take milkweed. And so there's questions yeah. about the thin leaf and the wider leaf milkweed. And evidently everyone's milkweed is looking rather sad right now because it's winter. So a lot of questions of will that yeah. milkweed come back? Will it thrive again or do I need to replant it? Okay, so our native milkweeds, we have the narrow leaf and then we have the big leaf one. Um, they just look awful. I'm sorry, they just do. They're worth growing because we do need to support our monarchs, but they do get aphids and they, they look really bad by the end of summer. You should cut them to the ground right now because they, uh, they do harbor diseases over the winter. And uh, you want them to come out fresh from the ground uh, in the spring. So you can cut them down. Okay, that is all the time we have. It's, it's where we have a hard stop at 730. Yes. We have answered over 130 questions. Uh, we weren't able to get to all of them. Some are duplicates. 
But as I've said, please complete the survey, get the handouts, and we gave you those references where you can, in fact, get more information about growing natives. It's wonderful. So many people came out tonight and are so interested in growing native gardens. Anna, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you all. Have fun planting your native gardens. Good night. Good night.